It's really exciting to be here. I'm uh, humbled by all of the accomplishments of the Nobel laureates. And I'm also excited to talk to you a little bit about the future of intelligence from the lens of expertise, which is how people apply their skill and knowledge to solve problems in particular fields. As I stand before you today, I'm reminded of the first serious computer program I wrote back in the mid-'80s. It was what we call an expert system. It was to help my dad, who is a judge in India, to solve automotive compensation cases. I remember that day vividly because we demonstrated it to a colleague of my dad who went on to become the Supreme Court Chief Justice in India. Back then, we imagined and we dreamt that expertise could be captured in computing systems. But we very quickly ran into a lot of limitations. These systems were fragile, they were not very usable, and we could not actually achieve those goals back then. But today, we have so much data, we have so many new technologies, we have so much computing infrastructure that we can make those dreams come, come true. I think we've reached a point where the nature of expertise itself can be changed. This is a new era. To put it very simply, experts of the future will routinely work with learning and reasoning machines to do their day-to-day -day tasks in a very deep collaborative relationship between people and machines. And this is nothing to be fearful of. It is an evolution, as we heard earlier today. And I think that it is going to be much better for the world for all experts to be able to leverage these learning and re reasoning machines. I begin a set of demonstrations to you by asking a very simple question. What is the price of not knowing? Today, we pay a lot because we don't know how to manage the environment. We pay a big price for not knowing how to educate our citizens. And we pay a big price because we don't know what's wrong with our patients. And the reason we're not able to answer these very important questions is because there's a huge amount of data. There's a lot of complexity around us, as you already heard today. In fact, there's something like 2.5 exabytes of data that's created every day. And more than 90% of that data was created in the last two years. It's growing exponentially, as you heard before. And even the information that is curated, like, for example, in scientific journals and all of the articles and analyst reports, that is doubling. That's also on an exponential curve. Imagine if we could actually pull out the insights from this complexity. Instead of being overwhelmed, we are able to work in partnership with these learning and reasoning machines that can help us pull these insights and apply them in real time to the problems that all of us knowledge workers do every day. That's what we call cognitive computing. In IBM, the brand for cognitive computing is called Watson. And we got the first glimpse of this machine that we call Watson when we demonstrated in an exhibition match on Jeopardy, which you already heard before. The machine was able to get information from a wide variety of data sources, even the messy information that all of us people create, and answer open domain questions like Jeopardy in a very convincing way. The complexity of language is very high, and getting to understand the complexity of language is already a big step forward for machines. Let's take a quick look at how the machine did. And as you look at this video, please watch how Watson does with a little panel at the bottom of the screen. Let's do one bucket or less for 1,000. A 15-ounce VO5 moisture milks conditioner from this manufacturer averages a buck online. Ken. What is Alberto? Alberto, yes. 
Let's have also on your computer keys for 800, Alex. It's an abbreviation for Grand Prix Auto Racing. Brad. What is F1? Good. Uh, computer keys for 1,000. An additional section placed within the folds of a newspaper. Brad. What is tab? No. Ken. What's an insert? Insert is right. Let's go to uh, dialing for dialects for 600, please. Vedic, dating back at least 4,000 years, is the earliest dialect of this classical language of India. Watson. What is Sanskrit? Sanskrit is correct, and that takes you to 4,200. As you can see, the machine is very good not only at getting all the facts right, but also in understanding the nuances of language. Watson went on to win this match, and Ray talked about one of the more complex puns that Watson got right. I want to mention two things about this demonstration. The first point, as you saw at the bottom of the screen, was that Watson knew what it did not know. It was applying levels of confidence as it found information, matched them statistically, and tried to decide whether or not to press the buzzer. In some cases, it did not know, and it did not press the buzzer. The second, even more important point is that we built this machine not to be autonomous or in some kind of a uh, super intelligent machine, but rather we built this machine to understand us humans and how to work with us humans and what our world looks like. That was a demonstration of a quiz game, but we can now see a future in which we can ask computers like Watson the big questions. What is the root cause of cancer? Why are there so few women in the field of science? Can we actually reverse global warming? Now, these questions are much more complicated, and it requires research, and it requires deep understanding of the domain. And in order to answer these questions, you require, we require many dimensions of intelligence. Machines don't have all of those dimensions of intelligence. In fact, it is a combination of people and machines that can solve these big questions. Humans are very good at self-directed goals. You heard earlier today about bearing down. Humans are very good at common sense, lots of information that's not digitized. Humans are great at value judgments about what it means to live in our world. But machines, on the other hand, are great at large-scale mathematics, at discovering patterns in huge amounts of data, and even extracting knowledge and insights from huge amounts of data, and of course, doing statistical reasoning. But even more importantly, machines have to understand domains very deeply. If you look at how many of the AI systems are built today, some of them are built for personal, personal assistant question answering type applications, some of them are built for shopping, some of them are built for facial recognition and so forth, but we have taken a very different approach. In addition to building these applications, we have a platform that has the many dimensions of intelligence captured and decomposed in ways that can be recomposed in multiple applications. In fact, from the original system, we have now created dozens of different components that are available on the cloud as APIs that the whole world can build applications on top of. And today, we have tens of thousands of application developers who are building applications in every domain, whether it's to shop, to travel, to learn, to discover, to do research, to assist the blind, and in every industry that matters. Healthcare, financial services, education, resource-intensive industries like oil and gas, you name it. Our vision is that every professional on the planet, and that's a couple of billion of us, every professional who is a knowledge worker has a cognitive assistant like Watson to help them do their daily tasks. So what we've done is defined a 
category of systems, we call them cognitive systems, which will learn continuously, they will reason with specific goals in mind, and they will interact with us humans naturally. This is just the beginning of a journey. There's many breakthroughs that are yet to be made. I and my colleagues are researching many technologies that will help us get to better machine learning and machine reasoning and combinations of those. Many kinds of specialized infrastructure. It's not just the normal von Neumann architectures that we are all used to. We will probably need different kinds of architectures in the future. And also how to work with people more effectively, not just with an individual, but with groups of people, and do problem solving in a collaborative manner. Call that collaborative cognition. Let me get back to the idea of professionals or knowledge workers. As a medical professional with a computer cognitive assistant like the ones that I've been talking about, you can rethink medical imaging or oncology or any one of these fields that you're talking about. And these fields are already getting a huge lift because of the, of the presence of cognitive assistance. So for example, in oncology, the demand for oncologists is almost twice the supply of oncologists. The only way we can address this is by putting cognitive assistance in the hands of today's oncologists and training new ones. Drug discovery takes a really long time. By using cognitive systems, it can be shortened dramatically. Clinical trial matching, while there are lots of clinical trials that are happening today, very few of them are able to actually recruit patients. And, and even for those, it's very difficult for practitioners to understand the outcomes. Let me show you this example. Ultrasonic image has arrived. Tumor detection. Tumor has been found. Proceed to tumor characterization. Shape detection. Oval. Get clinical input from the patient files. High fever. Mastodynia. Tender left breast lump. Combined recommendation. Differential diagnosis. Either simple cyst or galactoseal. Patient management. Favor course of antibiotics over fine needle aspiration or incision and drainage. End of case processing. As you can see, this is a cognitive assistant that is providing information and options for a radiologist. This is a decision support system. It does not replace the radiologist, but it assists them to be much more effective than they are today. As an environmental scientist, you can rethink many things about how we manage our environment, such as air quality management or energy optimization, or even larger macro activities like planning for cities. Just this morning, we announced something called Green Horizons, a program we started in China, where, as you know, there are many environmental issues with particles, particulates. And we have found that with cognitive technologies, we can forecast much better how renewable energy can be generated. And we think we are on track for reducing the par particulates by 30% by 2017, doing this more globally. If you're a researcher, as many of you are in this audience, you will be very interested in this application where you ask the hard questions, and a computer like Watson can come back with all of the claims. It goes through huge amounts of data from corpuses, comes back with claims and evidence both supporting or opposing your claim. You can do your research reports much faster in minutes instead of in days or weeks. So what does it all mean for the future of expertise? As I said before, in the future, experts will work with cognitive assistance on a routine basis with learning reasoning machines. And the average expert of tomorrow will be much better than the top experts of today. And I would say that most of us will be as good as the best experts of tomorrow. So there's nothing to fear about this. I think we should need to understand more so we can 
take the world to a better place. Thank you very much. Thank you.